let us again begin as we began last week. We just took a few minutes to sit with our two feet on the floor, <laughs> our hands on our thighs, our back against the chair, <laughs> and I would like to ask you to take a deep breath in, very slow though, and hold it. And now exhale. As you breathe in, breathe in either through your mouth or your nose, but slowly. And as you do, notice what happens with your abdomen, with your chest cavity, and with your shoulders. Do you notice that when you breathe in, everything tightens within you and then as you breathe out it's like a balloon that you burst and you relax and so this time let us take a moment to be still to be quiet to close our eyes and in our own hearts ask the Lord to bless us with wisdom with insight with faith and with joy. Come, Spirit, come. 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 We've been on a journey for two Thursday nights. We've gone from Israel the upper room in Jerusalem at the Lord's Last Supper. We are present when he took the bread and wine, broke the bread, gave it to his apostles and friends, his guests, who were having supper with him, told them to take and eat. And likewise, he took the cup of wine, and he asked them to drink in memory of him. And so we have through the generations, and we in our own lives have taken the bread and the wine. And we know it isn't bread and wine, but it's the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. If you recall, in the first and second centuries, being a Christian was very dangerous. First Paul, or who was then Saul, was out to kill all the Christians because they were defying the precepts of the synagogue. And the Lord really made him fall off his horse. And he became one of the Lord's favorite prophets, preachers, and one who loved him. So we learned that the early Christians celebrated the breaking of the bread in homes, in the home of a person in their little community that had enough room to welcome people into her upper room or into his. And there, if you recall, they had a meal. And remember the abuse that came about? Anybody remember it? What was it? Anyone? They didn't share. Some didn't share. Those who had plenty didn't share with those who had meager. And that angered Paul very much. And he said, this is not what the Lord wants of us in his supper, at his meal. Their numbers, in spite of that, their numbers swelled, and the upper room became too small. So where did they go? To the courtyard, to the atrium. And there they had a wooden table, and everyone stood around it, probably in twos and threes. And there they had what we call the breaking of the bread. And this is how it went, for your memory. 
It began with the gathering and a kiss of peace. It began with a prayer with extended arms. It continued with the reeling of scripture, the praying of the Psalms, or a psalm, a sermon. And then it continued with offering the gifts for the altar to be sacrificed, but also to be sent to those who were homebound, who could not be present with them. And then the presider, after everyone received Eucharist, the presider made up his own prayer, composed his own prayer in the name of the community, to which they all said amen, and they went home. We remember that in the third century, the presider couldn't compose his own prayer. Now it was set. It was set in, in pen, and it was set on, by the scribes. And that was by Bishop Hippolytus. Say his name, Hippolytus. Isn't that a strange name? But it's got rhythm to it, Hippolytus. Well, anyway, he was the one that wrote the formula for what we call the Eucharistic prayer. And do you remember our second Eucharistic prayer is his from the third century? They added little by little memory of the dead. They said a prayer for the deceased in their communities, to which Abel said, Amen. Then remember we went to the fourth and the early, to through the fourth and the early sixth, and we said this was the golden age of the Eucharist. And when did the word change from breaking bread to Eucharist? It was when they went from the upper room, where they broke bread at the meal, to the courtyard, to the atrium. And there they celebrated Eucharist. And does anyone remember the meaning of Eucharist? Thanksgiving, that's right, Thanksgiving. It's a celebration of Thanksgiving. And so they celebrated thanks and praise to God who gives us all, who gave them all. And so what we have in the fourth and sixth centuries, they began building churches after Constantine was, um, I was going to say inaugurated, but he was um, officially made the first Holy Roman Empire. How's that? Emperor in 313. And so when that happened, he gave permission for the early Christians to gather in a building that would be reserved solely for the community to come and give thanks, to come and, ex and celebrate Eucharist. And why was this? He wasn't a Christian, so why was he so benevolent to the Christians? His mother, you know, you get gold stars. <laughs> His mother was Christian, and so he loved her so. He loved who she was, and he knew it was because she had found Christ in the Christian community. She found love. And so we have the building of our first, what we call churches, but it was called kudios, which means building of the Lord, house of the Lord, in Greek. In Greek. And so, anyway, we have the church, and which way does the apse face? East. Remember that? We all tried that last time, remember? We all turned east, and I, I, was, the, I was the proxy presider. We all turn east, but as you pray, or as the presider prays, all you see is, are the doors. So... Then, later on, as centuries went on, the priests turned. He turned, they turned the apse around, remember? They turned the, they didn't actually pick up the buildings and turn them around. But what they did do was, those that they built, instead of the apse facing east, they have the altar facing east. And as I look around here, I think most of us know what it is to celebrate Mass with the altar facing the east and the priest praying at the, at the altar facing the east as we are. We're like a parade and he's the leader. Then we said that during the golden age, the um, Christians 
decided to use the word that the Romans used when they ended a gathering, when they ended a consistory. And what was that word? M Misa S. Go. This is a dismissal. The meeting's over. Go. So the early Christians in Rome felt that they had gathered, they had assembled together, one mind, one heart, one joy, one love. And so they used the word Misa. And so what did the, for centuries, what does the priest did say, and sometimes they still do, go, the mass is ended. Go, preach the gospel by the way you live, etc. So the changes are little by little. We didn't turn, we didn't take a rabbit out of a hat, and suddenly there was a great big church such as we belong to now. This came little by little, year by year, century by century. And then we know that um, as the Romans were conquering northern, uh, uh, northern Europe, they took with them who they were, right? So they took with them their language as they worshipped their gods. And that language was? Oh, I didn't hear it. Oh, come on. Latin. The Latin was their vernacular, yes. Latin was their native tongue in which they spoke in everyday life, like we speak English in everyday life. So then they went to Germany, and they went to Ireland, and they went to the Scandinavians all the way up to England. And wherever they went, missionaries followed them and began to teach the people about Jesus, his love, his passion, his resurrection, his presence. And they invited these people to worship this Jesus with them. But of course, it wasn't in the language of the people. It wasn't in German or Gaelic. It wasn't in Scandinavian or Swedish. It was their native tongue, which was Latin. Slowly, little at a time, Latin became the official language of the Mass. Now, I know when I was growing up, nobody in the congregation knew what the priest was saying. But we were there. My mom was there with her rosary. I was there with my missile to St. Jo St. Joseph's Missal. But the priest was doing his thing, and the rest of us were doing our things. And we only came together at the moment of consecration and celebration and reception of the Eucharist. And so, as we move from century to century, we see that Little by little, there are new nuances, new prayers added, and many of those prayers come to us from the Judeo tradition. And so we are just a bundle of, I guess you could say, we've been going ourselves to a place like um, St. Uh, Vincent de Paul's, and we've been getting secondhand or used items. And that's exactly what the people did, the Christians did in the early centuries of the church. They had nothing. They had no books that said, this is what you do now. This is what you read now. No. And actually, none of the peasants even knew how to read. And so today, we're going to take all that we had experienced in the earlier centuries, up to approximately the 16th century, which is the early 1500s, and we're going to go into what began in our Catholic Christian faith. What's the word I want to use? I guess what I want to use is um, it's the Protestant Revolution, but I don't want to use that. Protestant Reformation. I don't want to use that either. There is a group of people at that time that were longing and hungry for what you and I hunger and long for. And it is a deep spiritual life with our God. They found solace in the church. 
at that time, not all priests, not all priests, at that time, a good number of priests and bishops were not serving the people as the people deserved and needed. And one among those priests, an Augustinian priest, was Martin Luther. And he saw the, um, the way that the priests and the bishops were annoying, were um, after the peasants, the ordinary workers, while they themselves were among the elite. And sad to say that if I wanted to become a bishop and I had no money, I would go to everybody that lives in this little table here. And I would say, you know, if you give me $10, that's going to be 10 years off of purgatory for your beloved husband. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. They bought their call to serve the congregation by the, from the money of the poor, the money of the peasant, rarely the money of the wealthy. And so Martin Luther was very against that. He says, you cannot buy eternity. You cannot buy years off of purgatory. We have no idea what we're talking about. There are no years in God's eyes. God is. Jesus says, my name is who I am. To Moses, Yahweh says, I am who I am. I am. God is always in the present. We go from past to present to future. So the Council of Trent met. They looked at all the accusations that Luther had imposed on them. Now they were embarrassed and they were angry because he hung up all the abuses. It's like if we hung up all our sins. Did your mother always say, we don't tell people what happened in our family. We don't hang up our dirty laundry. And that's exactly what Martin Luther did. He was exasperated because no one would listen to him. He was eventually excommunicated because he wouldn't rescind whatever he had said. He believed. And his faith believed. He believed. And so when things calmed down, in 1545, we have the Council of Trent, which means the bishops got together in a little town of Trentus, which is in Italy, by the way, and they had this meeting. They had this council. So tonight we're going to look at the Mass from the Council of Trent to this very moment we're sitting here in this room. So you better put on your warm clothes and take your vitamin pills because we're going to go on a journey that's quick, deep, and curious. All right. So the priests and bishops gathered together in Trent. What shall we do? They knew that some of the abuses that Martha Luther had, that Luther had um, named was true. So this is what they did. Now, just pretend you're, you're a person of that time. You're a, you're a catechumenate. Or you're a Christian. They reaffirmed the real presence of Jesus' body and blood in the Blessed Sacrament. Why so? That is one thing Luther did not believe. Luther believed that God was in everything. Luther believed that Jesus, Holy Spirit, and God our Creator exists in all that is. So we didn't need, in his estimation, an added real presence. He felt that God was present really in everything. So the Council of Trent sacramentally approved that the real presence of Jesus does exist in this bread and wine at the moment the priest utters the words of consecration. Up to this time, the buildings in which the people went to pray did not have an adoration chapel. 
and they did not even have a tabernacle. Do you remember last week or the week before? I can't remember which it was. I said, who took the bread, who took the Eucharist from the table after the service was done to have and to hold in case there was a need for a sick person between now and the next Eucharist we celebrate next Sunday? We're lived usually in the priest's home, yes in a very special room, but in the priest's home. Now, they're building and creating a tabernacle to look something like the Ark of the Covenant. And again, it's taking what we know from Judeo tradition. They also sanction the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. They encourage frequent communion. Why do they encourage frequent communion? Do you remember last, not last week, but two weeks ago, what did the priests and the bishops tell the people about receiving Holy Communion? They were unworthy to receive Holy Communion. They should not receive Holy Communion every time they go and celebrate the Mass. Well, they, scared, they frightened the heebie-jeebies out of the people. The people were frightened to go and to receive the Eucharist because they felt unworthy. Is there anybody in this room who feels unworthy? You don't have to raise your hand because uh, <laughs> we're, none of us is worthy. We're all unworthy. But Jesus doesn't say, come if you're worthy. Jesus just says, come, take and eat. And isn't that a beautiful act of a loving, compassionate God? Come, take and eat. So these poor people were told they couldn't receive frequently. So what did they do? You remember what I told you? They went from one church to another because the, the masses began at different times. And what did they think? They thought if they saw the Eucharist raised at the consecration, that whatever healing they needed, it would happen. They had the faith to believe. Nothing is recorded whether or not healing occurred, but their faith deepened. Yes. So now what the Council of Trent is saying, that probably wasn't a good thing, what we told the people 100 years ago, 200 years ago. We have to make a law. We call it our Easter duty. In that time, it was simply, they, they encouraged frequent communion and at least once a year, at Easter time. We, we still hear it. We have the opportunity to receive Eucharist at every Mass we retend, attend. So we needn't be concerned about an Easter duty. Got to go to receive communion during the 40 days of Easter, or else, or else. Eucharistic devotion started once the tabernacle was built, the tabernacle was placed in the building where the people worshipped, and people prayed before the tabernacle. The one thing that the Council of Trent did, in my estimation, that was derogatory how, or unfortunate, but it was rectified. Since the time of the Council in Trent to 400 years later to the Second Vatican Council, you and I could only receive Eucharist under one species, the bread. No longer could they receive both the bread and the wine as they had since they were in the upper room after Jesus' ascension. This particular um, council also promulgated a law of fasting. Remember the old days? Nothing, no food after midnight. And no liquid after midnight. That, that we're, we're in the 16th century now. Okay? And they designated the age for receiving First Holy Communion. 14 years old or older. Okay? They mandated that 
you must receive the sacrament of penance. That's what they called reconciliation in those days, the sacrament of penance. You must receive the, and by the way, that came to us from Ireland. It was the Irish monks that labeled the confession of sin and the forgiveness of God, sacrament of penance. Well, anyway, they said that it, you must receive the sacrament of penance if you've committed a mortal sin. The people didn't know what a mortal sin was. They knew what sin was. Sin is sin. Regardless of whether it's little or big or medium, turning one's back to God is sin. So in that case, everybody should go to confession before every time we receive Holy Eucharist, which is not true. And the council reaffirmed Latin as the official language. So it was no longer the vernacular of the Romans. It was now the official language of all Christians who celebrated the Eucharist in the Roman Rite. And that's you and me. Okay, now, I'm, take, I'm bringing some company along. Oh, by the way, this, is, this next one is um, what we're doing today. We're going from the Mass at the Council of Trent, and we're moving towards the Second Vatican Council. And from there, we will come to the celebration of the Eucharist today. Okay, here's a jolly-looking pope. <laughs> this is a portrait of Pope Pius V. And he was pope from 1566 to 1572. And you might say, well, what's he got to do with us? Lots. You know the uh, sacramentary that we have today? It is the book that the priest uses for the prayers of consecration, the Eucharistic prayer, the uh, prayer at the beginning of Mass, the prayer at the end. That is called the Roman Missal. This Pope, Pius V, he wrote a Roman Missal. He wrote a Missal. What was the Missal? It was a guideline of how to celebrate the Mass so that everybody in the whole Christian world, everybody in the whole Catholic world, would have celebration of the Mass exactly the same, whether it was in Australia or Brazil, the United States or the Congo. That no matter where you went, it is uniform, it is in Latin wherever you went, and the priests could not deviate a bit from it, or they were chastised, or their license to celebrate Eucharist was denied. So his idea was uniformity is unity, but we have learned through the years that unity is found in diversity, diversity of gifts, talents, skills, etc. So this was a how-to celebrate Mass. And so he knew he wasn't going to live forever. So this is what he did. He put down a promulgation that this Roman Missal is to last forever and ever and ever. I don't think anything lasts forever and ever and ever. But this was his sureness that no one would deviate from this uniformed rite of Eucharist. The other thing he did is that he standardized the liturgical calendar, created feast days for this saint, that saint, this holiday, holy day for Jesus, this one for Mary. But he also added something that I still remember as a young child. Couldn't understand it then, and I don't understand it now. <laughs> However, after communion, now remember, the priest is, is, is he's not facing us, right? No. We're all facing this way, the altar. Well, he comes down to the ambo, and what does he read? Anyone recall? I don't want to say anybody older than I, but anyone as mature as I am, does anybody remember what was prayed, what was read at the close of Mass? The second gospel? Thank you. 
John's Gospel, the prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, etc., etc. This Pope, Pius V, he thought it was a good thing to remember that Jesus is the Word that we carry in our hearts wherever we go. So that's why we're beginning our little reflection tonight with Pope V. But then we go to a jolly-looking Pope, but we're, and we're, what we're doing is we're skipping a few popes because the pope in between did nothing as far, as far as liturgical right goes. They did nothing to upset the Roman Missal, okay? All right, so we have Pius IX, who is pope from 1846 to 1878. I'd like to know what he's thinking about there. Uh, he, has a, he, he is quite special in the sense that he was the last sovereign ruler of the Papal States. The Papal States were dissolved in 1870. No, yeah, that's right, 1870. And he was Pope during that time. So he was the last sovereign ruler. We forget that the, the um, Vatican owned these different states in Italy. Italy wasn't united as we know it today. They were all different countries of themselves. And if you read the lives of any saints, or even Saint um, Francis of Assisi, they're fighting one another, just the way we do. They're fighting one another. Well, anyway, in 1870, Pope Pius IX was able, with the help of the Roman um, magistrate and the other magistrates to come to a decision, the unification of Italy. He is also noted for, it was he who proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And he did this on December 8th, the day we celebrate Mary's birth, uh, Immaculate Conception in 1854. We continue to celebrate it dutifully. Now, he called the first Vatican Council. He called the first Vatican Council in 1869, and it was in session through 1870. And this is important for us, because during that council, the only thing people remember, although the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was one of the um, documents of this particular Vatican Council, but the doctrine of the eternal shepherd was signed, sealed, and delivered, if we want to use our language. What is that? It's the dogma of papal fallibility, infallibility. What does that mean? I don't think the uh, clergy knows what it means. But let me read for you what it means. Because no one has used it except once since its inception. The statement on the Pope's authority was approved only after long and heated debate, both preceding and during the Council. The decree states that the true successor of St. Peter the Pope, has full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the whole church, that he has the right of free communication with the pastors of the whole church and with their flocks, and that his primacy includes the supreme teaching power to which Jesus Christ added the prerogative of papal infallibility. This is what it is whereby the Pope is preserved free from error when he teaches definitively that a doctrine concerning faith or morals is to be believed by the whole church. This Pope passed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. As Catholics, we have no choice but to believe in the Immaculate Conception, because he did this infallibly. Now, some among you may or may not believe in the Immaculate Conception. 
It's a struggle to believe what we don't understand, isn't it? But that is where faith comes in. So the dogma of papal infallibility comes to us from this nice-looking pope, whom I think is probably saying, I know something you don't know. <laughs> All right, we move on. He did his job. He passed the dogma of immaculate conception. He uh, passed, the, uh, the inf everyone had a vote. All those present had a vote. And by the way, this is just on the side. There were bishops who left the council the night before the voting was going to take place because they weren't brave enough to say no. Kind of sad, isn't it? We all have to vote, right? We say we have to all vote for president, for governor, for mayor. It's our civic duty. But those who stayed voted for the infallibility, but it's rarely been used. But it's in the books. Okay, now we have one that I'm sure we've heard of, although none of us were born. Doesn't he look like a spry old man? He kind of looks friendly, doesn't he? Pope Leo XIII. He was pope from 1878 to 1903. You know what he added? Every pope has to add, except the two that you're going to see up on the screen in a bit. This is what he added. He looked at the ritual of the Mass, and he added concluding prayers, the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. Do you know why? Because the world was in turmoil. France was in turmoil with Germany. The United States was in turmoil with Cuba. There was war in many and diverse places. And Leo XIII felt this was the evil spirit permeating the world. So who can we go to for protection? St. Michael the Archangel. And I have heard that being prayed in some churches that I go to now. Praying that Michael would protect us from the evil in the world. Pope Leo XIII consecrated the whole world to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And he initiated the annual celebration of the Feast of the Sacred Heart. The Friday after Trinity Sunday, and it still exists. He, alt he um, designated June as the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And he wrote a consecration to the Heart of Jesus hoping that people would consecrate themselves to the one to whom they truly belong. So today from him, we hear the St. Michael the Archangel. I know people who continue to pray it. Uh, we celebrate the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We reserve June in our imaginations and thoughts as the month of the Sacred Heart, as we do with Mary, the month of May. And he consecrated the whole world to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The next pope, when I was a little girl, I was in eighth grade when he was, uh, um, what's pope? Pope Pius X. And you know, I loved him. I fell in love with him. Not because he was handsome, but he was. But because he was poor, he came from a poor family. And believe it or not, I just found out a couple of days ago, he wasn't even Italian. <laughs> His last name is Sarto, but that's not really their last name. They, his mother and father and grandparents escaped from, I think it was, it was one of those, it was either Poland or it was um, Germany. I can't remember. But they escaped to Italy. And the only um, thing the father knew was farming. Well, a farmer in Italian, there must be a derivative, Sarto. So he, they changed their last name to Sarto. So this Pope um, Pius, his name growing up was Giuseppe Sarto. Sounds Italian to me. <laughs> anyway, he loved little children. He treasured the, in, the innocence of little children. And as a result, he's been known as the Pope who welcomed little children to Eucharist. 
He lowered the age for First Communion to seven, more or less, six, seven, eight. He felt the only thing these children needed to know was that this host, remember, who, who's the one that designed the host? Do you remember from two weeks ago? Charlemagne. Charlemagne in France. For, for what purpose? Expedite Holy Communion. Yeah, right. Okay, so he, um, what Pius X did is something that you and I take for granted. Up until this time, from the Council of Trent to this time, no one received communion during Mass. Remember I said that two weeks ago? No one received communion during Mass. At the end of Mass, the priest or the deacon would stand up and say, would all those receiving Holy Communion approach the altar? The rest of you please leave. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? But the funny thing is, as a wee little girl, I remember that. I remember going to the communion rail after Mass. Anybody here remember that? No? I do. Of course, I'm in the Boston area. I'm from Connecticut. So, you know, we... Anyway. Okay. He encouraged frequent communion. He said to the people, I know you've been told you're unworthy. I know you've been told you must receive at least once a year. But I am telling you, Jesus does not look at our unworthiness. Receive Holy Communion frequently. And let Jesus live within you day after day, year after year. And he did something wild, this Pope here, Pope Pius X. He took the Roman Missal and of, um, what's, I forgot the, the year. Well, anyway, from 16-something. No, it was from earlier, but I can't recall the name. But anyway, he took it, and he translated some of the prayers into the vernacular. His vernacular was Italian. So you see what's coming up. All right, now we have... We have two popes, and we're not spending time with these two popes. I'm sure they're very good men. But these two popes had a mission from the Lord. The mass was pretty set. Everybody knew what to do, what to do, what, how to do it. But the world wasn't set. And with these two men, they, um, Benedict XV, anybody uh, can guess what he might have been living with if you look at the years that he was Pope? World War I. World War I. He was Pope during World War I and during the 1918 epidemic, flu epidemic. He is the patriarch in Rome. He is Bishop of Rome. He had everything he could do to help bring about peace in the world and to also to um, visit and give encouragement to the people in Rome. So he had more than enough work. He was grateful that the Mass was as the Mass was. And his focus was on peace, reconciliation, and the welfare of the people. That was his Eucharist. And then we have Pope Pius XI from 1922 to 1939. And, and very little is written about him. But whatever is written about him, it has nothing to do with the celebration of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is stable since, Vatic, since um, Council of Trent. No need to spend time on it. Okay, now I bet you all know who this is. Anybody know who that is? Who's that? Pope Pius XII. Oh, I forgot to say something about Pope Pius XI. Pope Pius XI was the sovereign, I told you that. But he was the first pope to, I, to um, address the Christian ecumenical movement, 
We always give credit to John the 23rd as being the man of ecumenism, and indeed he was. This pope here, Pius XI, um, he also wanted unity. And so he kind of got ecumenism off the ground. But you know what his idea of, of unity was? Anyone guess? That all the different Protestant denominations would all come back to the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> and you and I know that that didn't happen and how it would be nice if it did. Father, may they be one as we are one. So his interpretation of ecumenism was a return of all Christian denominations to the Catholic Church. I hope he's praying for it because maybe someday it will happen. So here we have Pope Pius XII, 1939 to 1958. He was Pope when I was a little girl. And um, in just my first year and second year in religious life, as I see, he did changes in the Eucharist, and some of these you're going to remember. In 1953, think of where you were in 1953. In 1953, he changed the requirement of fasting before receiving Holy Communion. In 1953, he said drinking water was permissible. And he relaxed the fasting from midnight for the sick, the travelers, the laborers, and priests who celebrated several masses in one day. In 1957, in addition to drinking water is permissible anytime, he changed the fasting, the time of fasting, and we're still doing it. What is it? One hour? Three hours. It, it, it was three hours. It's, you're right, it's one hour now. He changed it three hours of fasting from solid food. Um, and I have to laugh at this one. A three hour fast for solid food from solid food and alcohol. <laughs> a one hour fast from other liquids. You can have a Coke an hour before Mass or a glass of milk. Pope Pius XII initiated the use, he allowed the use of hymns sung in the language of the people during Mass and during other sacramental rites. And he went so far as to permit the entire Mass to be prayed in the vernacular as we do today, this is 1960 maybe, in mission countries. Wherever the missionaries went, they celebrated in the language of the people. I have a quote from him that I thought is very, very endearing. The use of the mother tongue in connection with several of the rites may be of much advantage to the people. Of course it is. Of course it's an advantage to understand what's being read, to understand what's being preached, to understand what's being prayed. Saint Pi uh, well, he is, he is a saint, isn't he? Pope Pius XII instituted the Feast of Our Lady and Saint Joseph. He instituted the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and he designated August 22nd as that feast. Within the fast years, Vatican II, the Feast of the Immaculate Heart was Mary was moved from August 22nd, and it was moved to the day after the celebration of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So on this Friday after Trinity Sunday, we celebrate the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the day after on Saturday, we celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. On May 31st, we celebrate the Queenship of Mary. And on May 1st, we celebrate the Feast of Saint Joseph the Worker. Now, why do you suppose he inaugurated that particular feast? We already had March 19th to combat communism. May Day, 
May Day in Communism, their parades, it's a great gala. They're celebrating their communistic regime and their, and their rule. To combat that, he celebrate, we celebrate St. Joseph the Worker on May 1st. There's always a reason why people do what we do, isn't there? Yeah. Now, I'm not prejudiced or anything, but this is my man. <laughs> Here we have Pope John XXIII. He reigned only five years, but he turned the church upside down, and it's never been the same. He was pope from 1958 to 1963. And when he was elected, the world was shocked. Who wants this old man to be a pope? What does he know? He has a big nose. <laughs> <laughs> and so the world was shocked. But he shocked it even more. He began serving as pope in 1958. In 1959, January 25th, 1959, at the Church of St. Paul outside the, the Rome, outside the gate, outside the gate. After Mass, he told the um, clergy to remain. Of course, the clergy were the bishops and the cardinals and you know all that good stuff. And he sat down and he said, well, I have something to tell you. I am going to convene a Vatican Council and they looked at him like he was crazy. <laughs> what are you kidding, Holy Father? It'll take years to prepare for a Vatican Council. And he said, I'm an old man. I'll give you two years. <laughs> and in two years, they had the Vatican Council all formed and ready to go. What was the mission of the Second Vatican Council? Second Vatican Council was convened for the spiritual renewal of the church and an occasion of Christians separated from the church to join in a search for Christian unity. The Second Vatican Council was in session from 1962 to 1965, two separate sessions. Unfortunately, John XXIII died between the first and the second um, session. He did not live to see the fruition of his labor. But you know, God knew what to do in the right moment. He looked around at all the, all the cardinals, and I bet you, he said, this is the one who will help me renew my people. He only lived five years as Pope. But he did a marvelous thing in a small way. He brought about a change in the church forevermore. One author that I like very much says, he lived long enough to prove observers who said during the infancy of his papacy that the archbishop with the homely face was constantly lit by a friendly, broad smile. He is a man most certainly will be loved. We have a lot to own to this man, Pope Paul VI. Pope Paul VI was elected in 1963, shortly after Pope um, John's death. He had the power as Pope to say, I discontinue the Vatican Council. I close it down. Nothing will be done and nothing will be said. But he did not do that. He continued in the footsteps of Pope John XXIII. He saw the necessity of life renewed within the church. Remember John's words, we need to open up the doors of our hearts, of our church, of our homes. Open the doors, let fresh air in. He was right. Okay, so Pope Paul VI was the, was the Pope upon completion of the Second Vatican Council in 1965. 
just for your imagination. The council was composed, just imagine people getting a consensus. The council was composed of 2,000 to 2,500 bishops and thousands of observers, auditors, sisters, laymen, laywomen, during four sessions between 1962 and 1965, it produced 16 documents. And these documents are all considered the foundation for the church as we know it today. We're going to look at the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. I brought my little book, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. So if you don't believe in what I'm going to say from now on, I just invite you to go to um, Amazon. Amazon has everything. They have the Constitution of the Divine Sacred Liturgy. Okay. What does the Constitution on the Sacred uh, Liturgy establish? It establishes a principle of greater participation of the laity in the sacred celebration of Eucharist. Would you agree? Yes. I, you know, as I said, I remember we in the pews did our own thing with our own prayer books and rosary, and the priest is up there praying, and the bell rings, and so that means we're attention because it's consecration. Bell rings, and it's attention because it's time for, to receive Eucharist. But we're singing together, and we're praying aloud together, the priest and the congregation. The Constitution of Sacred Liturgy authorizes significant changes in the texts, even in that Roman Missal that was supposed to be written for eternity, forms and language used in the celebration of the Eucharist and in the administration of sacraments. Have you been hearing me saying celebration of Eucharist a few times? Why am I saying it? Because one of the things that the Second Vatican Council changed was going back to what it was in the early church. From the breaking of the bread, it became, as the numbers grew, the Eucharist. And so after Vatican II, so it was very hard to change people's vocabulary. We all still say the Mass. I prefer to say the Eucharistic celebration which is what the sacred congregation calls it today. It's a liturgical, it's a sacred congregation. It's a celebration of the Eucharist. It's a celebration of Thanksgiving. Okay, now this is what the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy is. <clears throat> it dissolved the division between the, cler cl oh, between the clerics and the laity. How did it do that? Pardon me? Remove the altar railing, one. No longer is there a barrier between the congregation and the sanctuary. We are one. We are one. Pardon me? The priest is now facing us, and together we're praying as though in a circle of love. We're praying together. And of course, the um, churches where the altar is permanently molded into the wall, an altar was placed for the Eucharist in front of it, and still is in many churches. So I think if the um, Vatican Council did anything for the church, it really strove to bring about unity of hearts. Unity in prayer, unity in worship, unity in song. Next, we, as we said, the priest is facing the congregation. The communion railings have been removed. The choir no longer sings way up there, usually. But now the choir is among the people in the congregation, sort of like a right arm of it. We are all together. Do you get that unity being all together? I mean, it's, it's a beautiful witness of what love is. 
It's a witness of unity in worship. We come from different cultures. We come from different states, countries. We come from different lifestyles. And we all gather together. And we sing together. And we pray together. We receive Eucharist together. We are blessed together. It's a togetherness. The concept, just a simple um, mission of the um, Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. In the restoration and promotion of the Sacred Liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered above all else. Okay. Now we have this other happy chap. I wish he would have lived. I think he would have been a wonderful pope. But he looks so happy there. But do you remember he was only a pope for 33 days? And I'm sure he had much to do in his mind as far as renewal goes. But God whisked him away. And I'm sure that in heaven he prays for us. So that's his mission, to pray for our church on earth. Pope John Paul I. And here we have his successor, Pope John Paul II. He's pretty handsome there, don't you think? He was Pope from 1978 to 2005. He promulgated the first catechism of the Catholic Church in 1992. Before that, as children, those of us who went to a Catholic school or CCD, we had a blue book called the Baltimore Catechism. Anybody remember that? Okay. Well, that really, it was question and answer. I, I always got A's. It didn't mean I knew what I was saying. It meant that I could memorize what I ought to be saying. But here it was the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which has been revised since then. It's really not a catechism. It's a book of reflection reflecting who we are as Catholics, how we live as Catholics, how we are fed as Catholics. And my most favorite part of the catechism is chapter is the fourth section on prayer, Christian prayer. And I have one sentence in that whole section that means much to me and I share it with you. It is a quote from St. Augustine, who lived in the 300s, by the way, whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not, prayer is an encounter of God's heart with our heart. God thirsts that we might thirst for God. God thirsts that you and I might thirst for God. God hungers that you and I might hunger for God as God hungers for us. It matters not what we say. It matters not the prayers we pray. It's to be with the one who loves us, who calls us by name, who assures us he is with us always. So it was Pope John Paul II who promulgated the Catechism of the Catholic Church, such as we have today. It's been revised. But if you don't have one, I suggest you go to Amazon <laughs> and, and, and just once in a while pick it up. You don't want to do the whole thing. It goes by numbers, but it's certainly a book of reflection and prayer. Under his influence, he emphasizes that liturgy must necessarily be rooted in deep love and in respect for liturgical tradition. Key, key to his papacy. He encouraged choirs to return to Gregorian chant. Well, guess what? Most people in the pews had no foggy notion what Gregorian chant was. You know, we might have been singing a few hymns to Our Lady in English, a few hymns to Jesus in English, but that's about it. So Gregorian chant might have made it in the seminaries and in the convents, but it didn't make it too well 
And really, you need to take a course to sing Gregorian chant beautifully, calmly, rising and falling according to the meaning of the word you say. So, I had a shock. You know when New Age came out and everything was New Age? I went to the music store, I was going to say the record store, and then I'd be really dating myself. <laughs> I went to the music store because I wanted to get a, um, a, a um, cassette tape with Gregorian chant. You're not going to believe this, but I picked this one up and it said, do not use during driving, dangerous. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> because it's flowing, it's gentle, it's, you know, you go high, low, but it's a gentleness in it. It's beautiful. Okay, so that's enough of that. So, <laughs> all right. And, okay, so now, this is important for you to hear. He empowered bishops to authorize on certain conditions celebration of the Trinitine, Trinitine Mass for priests and lay people who request them. What is the Trinitine Mass? It's the Latin Mass before the Council of Trent. It's all in Latin. And the priest faces the altar. I understand there's, there are two churches in our archdiocese who have permission to have the Latin Mass, and that's St. Monica's in Duluth. And they've replaced the communion rails. So what have they done? You stay there and I'll stay here. Right? They have permission. And they celebrate it each Sunday morning. And the second is the Church of St. Um, Francis de Sales. And they have a community of, um, I forgot the name of the, the priest, but they're in keeping with the Catholic Church. They have permission as well to celebrate the Mass and sacraments in, um, in Latin. So here we have Pope Paul, the, John Paul II, I said this, he's, he said the liturgy must be rooted in deep love and respect for liturgical tradition. Love and respect is precious. We ought to respect and cherish our traditions, our family traditions. When I work with young parents, I say, share the traditions of your culture with your children. <laughs> I mean, I'm so tied up in my Italian traditions, I have nobody to share them with. <laughs> but those of you that are grandparents, aunts, uncles, you babysit somebody, share the traditions of your nationality, of your family unit, because they hold the string that keeps the generations together. To respect liturgical tradition does not mean we have to put it on again. We respect it for what it was. We respect it for what it offered us. We respect for what we have. Respect, reverence. Then we have our dear, oh, what happened? I missed somebody here. Pope Benedict, what happened to him? He got lost in the muddle, but anyway, he, he was our pope from 2005 to 2013. In July of 2007, he wrote an apostolic letter. An apostolic letter is a letter that a pope can write to uh, the bishops. And he kind of tells them what he feels they need to do with the people in their diocese. This is what Pope Benedict XVI's letter said. He acknowledged the right of all priests to celebrate the Tridentine Latin Mass using the Roman Missal as it was revised in 1962. I'm going to repeat that. He acknowledged the right of all priests to celebrate the Tridentine Latin Mass using the Roman Missal of 1962. And these priests may celebrate the Latin Mass privately or with the parish community if 
the community requests it and wants it, if. He also said that he gave permission for Latin to be used in the reception of the sacraments outside of Mass. That means baptism, confirmation, holy orders, matrimony, sacrament of the sick can be prayed in Latin. He also modified the vernacular in the celebration of the Mass. Okay? For him to respect liturgical tradition was to bring it into the contemporary world. But you know and I know there's strife in our church because of it. So let's look at, oh, he's right there. How do you do? Okay, so let's look at Pope Francis. Pope Francis was elected in 2013, and he writes an apostolic letter in 2021, which is just two years ago, a year and a half, really. And this is what he does. Now, you know they come from different theologies. Pope Benedict's theology was very um, conservative and traditional. Pope Francis's theology is very pastoral for the people, but I know who the people are. So you have the pastoral spirituality versus the traditional. Is one right and one wrong? No. Neither is right and neither is wrong which brings me closer to God. Okay, so in his letter, he imposes restrictions on celebrating the pre-Vatican Trinitine Mass. He, undo he undoes what Benedict did. Now he says the bishop of every diocese is the sole authority to decide whether or not the Tridentine Mass, that's the Mass of the Council of Trent, that was taken from Pope Urban, who wrote the original, that's forever, the Trinitine Mass may be celebrated. So he's the one who decides whether or not he's going to allow the Trinitine Mass to be celebrated in its diocese. This is very coincidental because just yesterday he sends a letter to the pastor saying that if only, people, only priests who approach him for permission to celebrate the Tridentine Mask may do so. But he has to approach the Holy See and get the permission. So you go to the bishop, I, I feel in my parish I want to do this and this, and the, probably the, in the letter that you're writing to the Pope, you have to say, is this what the people want? Is this is what they need? And so he's the, the bishop is the sole authority to decide whether or not the Tridentine Mass may be celebrated in its diocese. Okay, so Bishop, Archbishop Hartmeyer decided on two churches. The bishop decides the locations and the times of the masses according to the Roman Missal of 1962, according to the Trinitine liturgy. The liturgy before the mass, but he puts in the liturgy of the word must be celebrated in the native tongue of the people. So we can go to a Latin mass where everything is Latin, but when it comes to the liturgy of the word, that has to be in English, including the homily. Okay? Now, Pope Benedict said that the priest could um, celebrate the sacraments outside of Mass um, in Latin. Pope Francis is saying you can celebrate the sacraments in Latin but only with the permission of the bishop. So let me, are you with me? Yeah. Some of you are probably sad, some of you are probably mad, some of you are probably happy. That's because we're all different. And guess what? We all have the same God that we worship. Okay, so let me share with you what the consequences of celebrating the Tridentine Mass 
according to the Roman Missal of 1962. First, it reinstates the division between the clergy and the laity. We don't know Latin. You know, I, I studied Latin in high school, maybe some of you did too. But we don't know Latin, so why should I be forced to sing in a language I do not know the words? Why should I be forced to pray in a language I do not know how to pray? This is what Pope Francis is feeling for the people. How can we get close to God if we cannot communicate with God in our own mother tongue? Okay, so it marks the division of the clergy and the laity. The priest celebrates Eucharist facing the altar. The priest reads the Eucharistic prayer in a low tone, so we don't know what he's saying. The priest wears a Roman-style chasuble, a pre-Vatican-style chasuble, and the replacement of the communion railing. And this is an appeal from Pope Francis to the Catholic world, and I quote, Cease exploiting the old Latin mass for ideological reasons, for sentimental reasons. Start discovering the beauty of the new liturgy, the liturgy we have now, that grew from the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. Pope Francis is very much a Second Vatican Council pope. He knows all the wear and the tear, the tears and the arguments. He knows all the concessions. He knows the prayer that went on among the members of the council. And I dare say for people who feel that the Holy Spirit was not at the council, I feel for them. I feel they've lost a moment of faith. I feel for them. So in the, to end, the Constitution of Sacred Liturgy, this is the beginning and opening paragraph in this little book. The Sacred Council has set out to impart an ever-increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful, to adapt more suitably to the needs of our own times those instructions which are subject to change to foster whatever can promote union among all who believe as Christ, to strengthen whatever can help, to call the whole of humankind into the household of the church, into the heart of God. I know nothing more blessed and what peace we would enjoy among one another if we were all united in one, in heart and in soul. So, what I would like to do now is invite all of you at your tables to speak with one another, give everyone a chance to go around, and number one, what are you feeling? Number two, what did you learn? Number three, what did you like? Number four, what you didn't like? Number five, what you like to do with Sister Susan? <laughs> May I have everyone's attention? Are you talked out? <laughs> All right. I'm going to invite whoever would like to um, a word or two, how you're feeling or what you think. And, and my assistant, Suzanne, you have two Susans here tonight, you know? You have Susan and Suzanne. She will bring you the microphone. So a question or a reflection or a thought or a disagreement. You can disagree with me because all I do is to, to, write, to tell you what goes on. But that's all right. So anyway, yes. Sister, why do we sometimes sing in Latin now at Mass? Different responses, we sing in Latin. I suggest you ask our musician. 
Really, that's my suggestion to you. I was very thrilled when with Vatican II mm. because that meant that when Put I Put that up by your Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, good. I was very thrilled with Vatican II when I found out when Dan asked me to marry him that we could have a mass, a, a whole mass, because he wasn't Catholic, even though he wasn't Catholic at the time. And my sister had gotten married earlier before Vatican II, and they got married in like the rectory they didn't have the mass that we could have. So to me, that was a wonderful thing. Oh, yes. Thank you. How about somebody from here, this side? I heard chit-chatting, so there must be something to say. I want to know why do they will... Now, this is not moment or nothing. Why do they will... Now, don't get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> why do they will... I don't know what it is, but why do they will the Beano? I mean, the Beanie... Capello, oh. isn't it? Isn't it called a Capello? What is it called, what they will? Uh, and who else wears a hat like that? The bishop? No, no, no. Oh, the Jewish. Jewish people. Is he Jewish? All these no, they're not Jewish. Our, our Catholic heritage stems from the Roman pagans initially and the Judeo tradition, the Jewish tradition. And I got another question for you. Well, wait a minute. You, are you content with that answer? No. Well, it's the right answer. She's taking it out. No. Now, why? Whoops. She shut it off. No. No, no, it's on. Oops. Why is it they get the popes when they're older? You know what I mean? They're in the 70s or... S well, actually, that's not always true because Pope John Paul II was in his 50s when he was elected pope. So they don't do... And age has nothing to do. There's no discrimination of age. It's looking at who can best serve our church, our people at this time. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> well, sister, we were all very impressed with your historical background and and the the extent of the work that you must have to do to put this all together um, to know all this detail. I'm just curious, how long did it take to prepare this, or is this just something you have in your head? Well, I will tell you, it was my thesis when I was studying for my master's at Fordham University. Wow. And I love researching. I am a historian. And I just love history. History helps me to appreciate what I have today and who I am today. And so to be able to share with you all what is part of our history, it's our legacy that generations of Christian Catholics have passed on to us year after year after year, and we need to pass it on to the generations beneath us. So, um, it's, by the way, it still took me a long time to prepare for these three classes <laughs> because I did want to put them in an a outline for you that you could take it home. And, you know, if you go on YouTube, there are many different... Um, YouTube videos on the history of the church or the, um, Eucharist, but be careful who you hear. Look up their name first because we have all sides. We've got, you know, those that hate the church, those that love the church, those that, you know, are in between. So be sure that you do it from people that are notable and, and respected, you know, um, theologians, yes. Missionaries, yes. Um, I know many of you are devotees of Bishop Barron. You know, so it's someone reputable, be sure that. But they have many. Um, um, now, for those of you who have not seen the movie The Two Popes, who, ha who has seen the movie The Two Popes? 
For those of you who have not seen it, I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix. It's free on Netflix. It's a beautiful insight into the friendship between Pope Francis and Pope Benedict, that they were on opposite sides of theology, but they could be friends and they could love each other and still disagree. So um, I think that's it, but I want to thank you so very much for uh, <laughs> your coming every week. I just loved being with you all. And maybe we'll do one on Vatican II. How would that be? Yeah. Now, that one I have to prepare for. <laughs> Sister, we'd like to thank you so much for sharing not only your immense knowledge, but love of the Eucharist and um, our church. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, you're and you have a sign-up sheet. Um, you have enriched all of our, both of us, all of us in our knowledge and in our, in our faith. So thank you so much. You're welcome.